The shaders in Primal Engine are divided in two groups. Shaders that are used to render individual objects, which I also refer to as material shaders, are mostly authored by the user or game programmer. This is done either by writing the code directly or doing some kind of visual scripting with notes, similar to the material editor in Unreal Engine or shader graphs in Unity. This episode is not about this group of shaders, although I'm going to use the same method for compiling them. The second group of shaders is used internally by the low-level renderer. These are the engine shaders. For example, there are shaders for light culling calculations and post-processing effects. Today's video is about handling this group of shaders in the engine. The way compiled shaders sit in that block is pretty simple. It starts with a 64-bit unsigned integer that contains the size of each shader's bytecode, followed by the bytecode. This is repeated for each shader in the blob of memory. Here I would like to give a high-level overview of the Forward Plus renderer. Although displaying 3D objects using rasterized triangles is well understood and straightforward, Realistically lighting a 3D scene remains one of the challenging parts, if not the challenging part, of real-time rendering. There are three common and one less common approaches to real-time lighting. The three common methods are forward rendering, deferred rendering, and forward plus rendering. The one less common method is ray tracing, but its usage is increasing with the new ray tracing hardware. For now I'm focusing on forward plus technique. If you'd like to know more about other rasterizer techniques, I would recommend this excellent writing which discusses all three of them. In my implementation, there is a depth pass or depth pre-pass that generates a depth buffer or Z buffer for the current frame. We also calculate a frustum grid at least once, and again if a window was resized or the camera's field of view was changed. The depth buffer is used to determine which parts of the scene are affected by which lights. This is the light culling or light binning step. I'll go into more details when we actually go and implement these steps. When we know which lights affect which parts of the scene, we can render the scene in one or more passes for opaque and transparent objects, using light data and reading from depth buffer. The resulting image is then downsampled for various purposes, like bloom effect and rendering semi-opaque objects. Finally, the image and its downsampled array are passed to the post-processing steps where we apply different effects such as bloom, tone mapping, and screen-based effects. The final composite image is then rendered to the swap chain's back buffer to be displayed on the screen. The depth prepass and render pass are collectively referred to as the geometry pass or g-pass in my videos. In this episode, I'm going to set up the submodule that handles the geometry pass. In the next episode, we are going to work on post-processing step. Imagine we want to use the depth information from a scene to determine which lights affect what parts of the world that is viewed by the camera. First, we generate the depth image of the scene using a depth-only pass. This will write the depth values of all rasterized pixels to the z-buffer. Next, we want to read this information in a compute shader to calculate light intersections with the objects in the scene. Because in general not every object is lit by every light in the scene, this greatly reduces the work that needs to be done to determine the color of each pixel. Obviously, we only want to read from this buffer when depth pass has finished writing depth values. But how do we know when the buffer is ready for reading? Here is where resource barriers come in. Before DirectX 12, setting barriers was the responsibility of the driver. Although drivers often did an excellent job of applying barriers, there was always some extra overhead because it's rather difficult, if not impossible, to know the exact render path of a program. DirectX 12's barriers are intended to diminish this overhead by putting the responsibility of placing them in the hands of the developer. In order to do that effectively, developers now have to know a lot of nuances about barriers and resource states. That's why it's really important to read the documentation and everything else from sources who know what they are talking about. As the title of this presentation indicates, this is an oversimplified discussion of barriers and resource states. You are encouraged to read more about this subject, 
since it plays an important role in rendering using DirectX 12 API. So what do barriers do? Well, conceptually, you can think of a barrier as something that ensures that a resource is in a correct state before it's accessed for the intended usage. In the example of depth pass and light calling, the barrier prevents reading from the buffer resource while it's still being written to. Again, in reality, there is much more going on. For instance, the memory layout of the resource could change to optimize access for different usages, or even the entire pipeline could get flushed. There are three types of barriers. The barrier in the former example is a transition barrier, which, as the name indicates, transitions a resource from one state to another. As I mentioned in the video about texture resources, each resource is placed or mapped onto a region in a D3D12 heap. Most of the time we use committed resources, which implicitly create a heap and map the resource to that heap. However, it's also possible to create a heap explicitly and place the resource in that heap. These are called placed resources. It's possible to place multiple resources in the same heap and even map them to the same region in the heap. For example, we could have an RGB texture resource as a render target and another texture resource that contains normal information of the scene and map it to the same offset in the heap. As long as we are not using those resources at the same time, we could alternate between them using an aliasing barrier. Another example is using aliasing barriers for streaming texture data using tall textures and reserved resources. The last type of barrier is the UAV barrier, which synchronizes reading from and writing to unordered access resources. So to wrap this up, remember that using barriers has performance implications. To use them effectively, read the documentation and other good resources. Use barriers only when needed, which is also described in the documentation. Apply barriers together when you can. That way, the GPU has more information in order to do optimizations. Use split barriers. A split barrier consists of a hint to the GPU that a resource is about to be transitioned before really setting the barrier. I'm going to get fancy and use split barriers in the next episode, so subscribe to the channel to stay tuned and get notified when that video is out. There is an excellent resource on various graphics programming topics, which is a blog written by Matt Petinio, if I pronounce it correctly, sorry otherwise, who is currently working at Ready at Dawn Studios. His blog articles have been a goldmine for me over the years, and I can't recommend reading them enough. It's also a fun coincidence that right when I was working on shader compilation videos, Matt wrote three articles about shader compilation. I just found out about these and still need to read them though. Anyway, if you'd like to read an in-depth discussion of barriers and resource states, this six-part blog post is the place to go to. I couldn't find any other resources that would explain it as detailed and were as well written as these articles. There are even animated slides so you can play the sequences and really understand what's happening. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your knowledge with us.